Starting like uh, with some uh, readings and uh, in like 20 minutes, and then we're gonna reach to the one of the best poets uh, he's ever written, like Havaran, and it's gonna be in two languages: first Farsi and then English. So shall yes. we start? Yes, I w we are going to start, but I want to put a song before that. Uh, which is actually a performance of one of the poems that I want to read, but it's, uh, it's done by an American singer. Uh, he was, his family was part of the Holocaust. Uh, so he left because of that. <coughs> I start with this. I, know, I hope that uh, things works here. With the Let's put it on. So reach a boy the only love or death can take me out of my orbit. So so what's happening in this poem is part of the experience I explained before that how language and nature are connected in this poem what's happening with me is that I was coming to Finland and I seeing such tall trees that they could not name them three. And in one moment, I saw a bird and I felt that the bird is bird. And I could name that bird. And I was asking myself that was happening to me, if I'm dying or if I'm going to fall in love. That, that, that moment was very important moment for me to discover the relation between the naming of an object and, and the name it, they had in Persian for me before. Because the trees we had in my region were completely different. The birds we had, if I can those phenomena bird or not. You know? So I start to read uh, some poems. <coughs> And I hope uh, they do not bother you much, but I try to read. An image initiates the voyage, and the voyage passes through kisses, wars, thirst, and intoxication. Your image is the totality of my voyage without being my destination. In the distance between your image and you, time is sitting and will never leave either one of us. One day in the doorway, with a kiss, we will be added to the absences within your image. In the white window behind me, the curtain is open, and a little girl on a blue bicycle crosses the street. Old men are drinking their morning coffee. It's a cold day. The sea is roaring. Mm -hmm. 
I wrote a poem full of waiting and rain, a poem where all my hair turned white, a poem that taped its back on the window, and the window remained closed. But the walls are scrapped away, and the doors are slammed shut, and the soldiers are still in my hands. I wrote a poem full of waiting and rain, and there, instead of the lines of the paper, snakes were slithering. I go to write your name, and the snakes wrap around my hand and pull me inside to the depth of the whiteness of the paper. I call you. And when the tears make the paper wet, the words wake up from a heavy sleep. They yawn, shave, then put on their uniforms and start to march. But a word standing in front of the mirror calms her hair, smiles, open the door and leaves. The rain keeps raining and she will be wet. Certainly she will catch cold. I wake up. My poems has been removed and I have an umbrella. This is a poem I read yesterday in Persian. <clears throat> I want to read it in English now and then we go to a session of reading in Persian and, and English. Yamsa, a tribute to absence in memory of Farzad Kamangar. Farzad Kamangar was a 32-year-old teacher, poet, journalist, human rights activist, and a social worker who was hanged on the 9 May 2010. At his execution, he offered chocolates to all the observers. <clears throat> I'm sitting at the end of the world in Yamsa, on a small island you can walk around in an hour. Sufficient time for you to know the date you are waiting for is not coming. Fifty years ago, it was, it was bought. They built some wooden cottages, a fireplace and an oven, and I arrived there by boat. It is rainy at the end of the world. Swans and boats are floating on the water. This does not come here. I was sitting on the boat when she, with her green eyes, was speaking to me about the age of the soldier's boat, which in her land lasts for more than 50 years. The fact that she misses me and loves fires and blue flames. The end of the world will not come again. Always, there is only one end, and nobody can interpret it. In Yamsa, nobody speaks his own language. In winter, when the lakes are frozen, wolves and humans come here walking. This place was never uninhabited. Everything that came here came in its perfection, your beauty, my impossibility, and in its intensity, language always disappears. One can only point to objects. People come to Yamsa with abstract nouns, but in the first fire, abstractions and wood burn together, and the taste of the chocolate turns to ash in the mouth. When the chair is pushed out from under the feet of a hanging man, an absurdity and meaning boss refers to the chocolate wrapper. At the same time, the stage is emptied of the killer and the killed, the viewer and the viewed, and the cleaner sweeps up the chocolate's remains. Sitting at the end of the world, the wind crawls into the fire, and all the flames are blue. 
absence is when you can point out all of the someone's attributes. Her green eyes, her moonlight skin, and her lips which are red. But you cannot point at her. Or when the woman who lies beside you does not have a nightmare that makes your hands caress a necessity. This is the reason God is always absent. Whether the chair is pushed out from under my feet or I sit in yams on a chair and the you of my poems change. In all the world wars, no bomb ever fell at the end of the world. It has never been occupied. No savior ever fit there. At the end of the world, I am burning papers where the skin of women and my hands mingle with decorations. Bouts row in nothingness. The wind crawls into empty houses and all the flames are blue. In Yamsa, time transubstantiates into experience. A day is the distance in fit between newly arrived boats and never arriving boats. A year is a distance measured in hands. It takes my hand to reach your hair. An eternity is taller than the hate of a human, the hate of a pushed away chair. When the feet no longer move, and the doctor in charge determines the rope can be taken away. The rope is taken away, and I get empty in the transubstantiation of bolt into bolt, hand into hair, and body into memory. I transmute to a place in Yamsa, a grave, a cradle where blue flames are the only burning metaphor that flickers just like a date at the end of the world. I'm sitting here in Yamsa, in shadow and reflection, song and the river, tears and the breath of infinity, in a boat which brings me back to you and my Palestine, to me and your Kurdistan. Arsenic burns blue, lead burns green. Arsenic and lead, poison and bullet burns in us. We miss each other and both are indebted to absence. It is rainy, the trains are delayed. At the last station with a blue umbrella, I'm searching for a woman with a red umbrella and green eyes. So the next one that we are going to read <coughs> would be in two languages. Uh, I want to read it in Persian for you to have a feeling of the, the rhythm of this somehow exiled language from the world of the emperors. And uh, for that, I need uh, internet probably, but I try to find. The, uh, the, pr the problem is my fight with the original, so I don't have any of them in the clear distance. My friend uh, Arezu, as they said, they told me, is going to read it in English, and probably better to read it, yes. Please. To read it in English first, while I'm going to find somewhere if I have that poem in Persian. Maybe we should do it the other way around that you read in Persian. No, first, first you start, I find the poem. Okay. Yes. تمام مش کن نه تمام مش کن تا آخرش من بعدش همش رو فارسی می خونم چون می خوام چیز کنم چون می خوام یه مقدار ریتم موزیکالش رو درست شه خب آره 
This poem is written about a cemetery in Iran. <coughs> in the 2009, the government of Iran announced that they are going to make a highway on a cemetery. I was truly shocked because I had a lot of friends whose father were, were buried in that cemetery. But the cemetery is not a simple, you know, cemetery as any other person, uh, person to person cemetery. It's a mass grave. It was a place for burying infidels in Iran, uh, the Baha'is in general, at that time. And uh, they used that place in a period uh, <coughs> nearly after end of the war, Khomeini, I write it. You know, I told this uh, story to Salman Rushdie himself. You know, Salman was visiting us in Mexico, and uh, I told uh, Salman that your fatwa was an excuse to hide another fatwa. You know, and Salman himself laughed and he said that. Somehow I agree. Yeah. So what I see on the story of the Salman Rushdie Khomeini after the war decided to uh, kill every people who were against, who were in the jail. So they decided to <coughs> use some questions and through that to condemn people to death. And they killed nearly 5,000 prisoners who were already in prison. Some of them, their time of the prison was already somehow ending. And they killed them all, and they buried them in, okay, some places. Mainly, they buried them in that cemetery called Khawara. No. Khomeini was a very clever man. So at the time, in the international level, he tried to condemn Salman Rushdie which was the winner of the Iranian National Book Prize. And the Iranian president at the time, which is now the supreme leader of the time, you know, Khamenei, gave him the prize for uh, his book, translated by a great translator, Mehdi Saudi to Persian. But he used him because he had a uh, Muslim origin and used him as an excuse to occupy the mind of the whole world on Salman Rushdie to forget one story happening inside the country, which was the Khawaran question, you know, the mass execution of many people there. And I myself had one of the first time in my life that, that I faced in a very horrible situation of the investigation in my house in Tehran was the time that I was writing a novel about the Khawaran. And at that time, I was probably wrong, very emotionate, you know, young emotionate, nearly 30. And I was writing that novel, and I called a friend mid of the middle of the night, and I tried to read one fragment of the novel to him. And that was my error, because tomorrow the the information, the intelligence system of the SEPA was in front of my house and they took away my hard drive and many other things I had at home. But the question that those letters that I read of the lovers of Khawar, the people who were in the jail and they were in love, man and husband, or the lovers who were writing love letters to each other, and most of them were sent on the, you know, the normal what but is clinics you know you have clinics and you write on it and those papers i scanned them at that time and still i have them and uh the scan version and on those those letters and those writings influenced me deadly and when i was very a small kid you know and my fathers and other were whispering about how around we had a neighbor, which I loved this guy, which very, you know, good looking man with always coat and cravat and always using bicycle 
in the street and I was when I was kid I wanted to always to go faster than him we always exchanged you know look with each other of the baby with old man his three sons were killed in cover and I remember his house was full of flowers you know, the outside of his house and when that cover an event happened you know many people died there including three of his sons I saw all the flowers little by little withering and I saw him getting little by little disappearing and he died after so the Havaran event was not a, huge, a small event or incident in a country it's a massacre happened by Khomeini and if we don't speak of it we all participating in the same massacre to massacre them again and again so this poem is related to that fact <coughs> words are the burying ground of things the trot of a horse through these lines is a sound i haven't heard since childhood your laughter wilted in my teenage years I write as if on pilgrimage to the city of the dead. If time by chance slips backwards, my father's memories will echo. In the ears of the text, the sound of a bullet will disturb the sleep of these lines, and a wide-haired poem will pace, a room that's been decade for years. Words have been arranged along the faded lines of a house. Here is a window. Behind the window, a courtyard. No one knows which nightmare awakens the poem. It sees sometimes at the window the glance of a neighbor's bride, sometimes the swing and the bicycle, or the wall with its cheap paintings. It looks at them until they come alive. Then to the inhale and exhale of living things goes back to sleep. Years ago, my father's murmurs <coughs> lost their way in the text of sleep and the poem lit 3,000 candles, built 3,000 paper boats and offered them all to the sea. Now that I have packed my bags and wait for the first train that would not return me here, and poem is riding a bicycle, trembling and in haste, it pedals through bumps and puddles, rings a doorbell, stares at the whispers and sobs, afraid of being heard. But the whispers are so loud in the ear, it is impossible to hear the whistle of a train. I'm still in the station, and the poem in Havaran protects the death of these past years from the gaze of the guards. A year ago, the poem slipped through barbed wire, where soldiers patrolled the hills of your breasts, stole your lips, your hands, recreated you piece by piece. This year, Soldiers guard the edge of nothing, your body long stolen. In the station, my bench is occupied by a dead whose name the poem doesn't know. It wouldn't learn your name either. Bullets and warm blood find their way into the lines. No paper can stop the bleeding. The station is full of passengers who are dead. The firing squads and the hanging ropes are not waiting for any train. Mumbling grave diggers ring the doorbells of 3,000 homes. 3,000 abandoned bicycles litter the alleys. The poem is not standing in front of a firing squad, nor does the firing squad know where on the poem to aim at. They simply hike the price of utilities, the rent and burial expenses. I cannot buy cigarettes for 3,000 dead, but I can bring them all back to life. 
I don't want to make the poem send them back to a cemetery that doesn't exist anymore. I only want to remind it that all the abundant bicycles have decayed by now, that no one will ever again hear the jingle of their bells. The dead will remain in the station, and if the poem can secure a ticket from each other, from each reader, it will send them off on the first one-way train. In my country, 3,000 dead in a station is normal. 3,000 dead on a train is normal. At the borders of stations, they arrest our tongues. Our words decay when they cross that line. I let go of your hands outside the station. The train's whistle harries my words. Words have filled up all the cabins. They dream thousand years nightmares. My words are young, just 30 years old, but they have piled up layer by layer under this prison guard. Yellow was not the color of my first school shoes, nor was red the color of my piggy bank, or blue the color of my first bicycle. Words grew up with the colors of your dress. They were a herd of fleeing horses, a rainbow that you would take off and send curving through the air, falling into the mud and dirt, into handcuffs, darkness, and the command to shoot. I'm not standing in this long line for bread and milk. I stand here to surrender my tongue. Everything crossing the border becomes lighter. <coughs> I stand to be translated. A bicycle rides my borders over bumps and puddles. The poem considers conjunctions and prepositions. The distance between I and I, the me to form an or me, it's raining, one conjunctions and prepositions on relationships. In the rain, the distance between us widens, and in that distance, Havaran grows larger. In my language, every time we suddenly fall silent, a policeman is born. In my language, on the back of each frightened bicycle sit 3,000 dead words. In my language, people murmur confessions, dressed in black whispers are buried in silence. My language is silence. Who will translate my silence? How am I to cross this border? <coughs> صدای اسبی را که در این سطرها یورت می رود از کودکیم نشنیدم و خنده های تو در نوجوانیم پوسیدند می نویسم انگار به زیارت اهل قبور می روم. اگر تصادفاً زمان مسیری معکوس تی کند پشپشه های پدرم در گوش مهد می پیچد و صدای گلوله خواب سطرها را برهم می زند و شعر با موهای آشفته در اتاقی راه می رود که سال هاست پوسیده است کلمات روی نقشه محب خانه شیده شدند اینجا پنجره است پشت پنجره حیات است کسی نمی داند که کدام کابوس شعری را بیدار می کند گاهی پنجره و نگاه دوزیده عروس همسایه را بر می دارد گاه تاب و دوچرخه را یا دیوار را با همه نقاشی ها و یرزن قیمتش آنقدر نگاهشان می کند تا زنده شوند و در فاصله دم و بازدم اشیا و زنده به خواب می روند سالها پیش پچپشه های پدرم در خواب های متنی آواره شد و شعر سه هزار شم روشن کرد سه هزار قایق کاغذی ساخت همه را با قیانوس سپرد حالا که من چمنانهایم را بستم و منتظر اولین قطاریم که مرا بر نگرداند شعر سوار دو چرخه است سراسیم و لرزان رکاب میزند بر دستاندازها چاله های آب زنگ دری را میزند 
و به نچاها و حقیقی خیره می شود که می ترسند شنیده شود بر گوش مد نجواهان قدر بلندند که سوت هیچ قطاری را نمی توان شنید من هنوز در ایستگاهم و شعر در خاوران مرده های چندین سال راز نگاه نگهبانان دور می کند یک سال پیش شعر از شکاف سیم های خاردار می گذشت سربازان بر تپه های پستان هایت پاس می دادند لب های تو را می دزدی دست هایت را و تنت را از نو می آفرید امسال سربازان بر لبه هیچ پاس می دهند تنت سرقت شده است در ایستگاه نیم کتم را مرده اشغال کرده است که شعر نامش را نمی داند همونطور که نام تو را یاد نمی گیرد گروله و خون گرم در سطرها رو سوخ می کنند هیچ کاغذی خون را بند نمی آورد ایستگاه پر از مسافرانی است که مردند جوخه ها یا تش تناب های دار منتظر هیچ قطاری نیستند پچ پچه ی گور کنان زنگ سه هزار خانه را به صدا در می آورد سه هزار دو چرخه در کوچه رها شدند هیچ شعری روبروی جوخ یاتش نیستاده است جوخ یاتش هم نمی داند که کجای شعر را باید هدف بگیرد فقط قیمت آب و برق را بالا می برد. نرخ اجاره و هزینه کفن و دفن را نمیتوانم برای سه هزار مرده در ایستگاه سیگار بخرم اما میتوانم همه آنها را زنده کنم نمیخواهم شعر را وادار کنم آنها را به گورستانی برگرداند که دیگر وجود ندارد فقط میخواهم به یادش بیاورم که دو چرخه رها شده پوسیدند و صدای زنگ مکرر در را هیچ کس نخواهد شنید آنها در ایستگاه خواهند ماند و اگر شعر بتواند از هر خواننده یک بلیت بگیرد آنها را سوار اولین قطار یک طرفه می کند در سرزمین من سه هزار مرد در ایستگاه طبیعی است سه هزار مرد در قطار طبیعی است در ایستگاه های مرزی زبان های ما را توقیف می کند کلمات من از مرز که رد می شوند می پوسند. من دست هایت را بیرون ایستگاه رها کردم سوت قطار کلماتم را دست پاچه می کند کلمات همه کوپه ها را پر کردند کابوس های هزار ساله می بینند کلمات من جوانند سی سالند زیر این لباس زندانی اما لایه بر لایه بر خود انباشتند زرد رنگ اولین کفش مدرسه هم نیست سرخ رنگ قلک و آبی رنگ اولین دوچرخه هم. کلمات با رنگ های پیرهنت بالغ شدند گله اسب های گریان بودند رنگین کمانی که از تندر می آوردی که در هوا قوس بر می داشت و روی گل و لای سقوط می کرد. روی دست بند تاریکی فرمان آتش برای نان و شیر در این صف بلند نیستادم ایستادم تا زبانم را تحویل دهم همه چیز از مرز که رد می شود سبکتر می شود ایستادم تا ترجمه شوم دو شرخه روی مرز های من راه می شود بر دستانداز ها چاله های آب شعر به حروف ربط و اضافه خیره می شود در فاصله من و من من از تر من تا از بر یا من باران می بارد بر حروف ربط و اضافه بر نسبت ها در باران من از تو دور می شوم و خاوران در فاصله من و تو وسیع می شود در زبان من هر وقت همه ناگهان سکوت می کنند یک پاسبان به دنیا می آید در زبان من بر ترک هر دو شرخی هراسان سه هزار کلمه مرد نشسته است 
در زبان من با پچپچه اعتراف می کنند با نجوا سیاه می پوشند با سکوت دفن می شوند زبان من سکوت است چه کسی سکوت مرا ترجمه می کند من چطور از مرز رد شوم تنکیو I'm here for any question. <laughs> so, um, shall we take like 30 minutes uh, for question and answers? Yes, of course. We have about a minutes. You know, I, I'm here and okay. we can continue for it. So, the first question. Ali. Um, so he's gonna ask the question in Farsi and one of our fellows is gonna translate it in English. I tried to translate. <laughs> uh, he says that yesterday you spoke about uh, uh, the poetry. relation poetry and exile and uh, the poetry creating another reality my question is that uh, an exiled person with uh, his own uh, or her own uh, um, subjectivity uh, can re, uh, communicate with the social phenomena in the uh, in outside and, and connect them to the poetry itself with the fact that poetry can create another relation, uh, another reality. Right. It's, it's a very philosophical question in, in that sense. But what I can clearly probably say in that sense is that, uh, okay, I, I believe that poetry starts from exile. I don't know any poet who is not in exile. No. Uh, from in Persian language, Ahmad Shamlu or Furu Farrokhzad or uh, Nostrat Rahmani, any great figure of the Persian poetry, to come to the German language figures like Rilke or Porcelan or you know even Goethe, and to go to other countries. Whatever I traced of the word poetry is happening in exile. The poet, from the very beginning of the writing is in exile because he lives in another reali reality out of the reality already existing around him so the poet <coughs> at, the, at the same time lives in somewhere which is not here there is a very beautiful song but uh, by an Argentinian singer I'm not from here and not from there. No. So Facundo Cabral in that, in a way, in that song, in a way, is expressing the fact of being in exile because the poet itself does not belong to that location. There is no location. There is no reality that you can connect the poet to that reality and say that this poet comes from that reality. No, it's impossible. The poet always lives in another reality. From the very, you know, simple point of the writing itself. But we go to other dimensions of the exile. The fact here is, I guess that what my friend Eduardo Milan was expressing and yesterday I explained that in a sense could solve that question is the question of the decentralization. 
one important thing in the conception of the poetry in creating another relation, uh, another uh, concept of the reality is the de decentralization in itself. Uh, a figure like mother or a figure like country, a figure like uh, language, all are figures of centralization. We have a center with uh, language. We have a center. I say that I'm Persian speaker means that I have I've been centralized into speaking Persian. When I say that my mother and her fear lives in me at the same time, that means that I am having a center in the figure of mother. At the same time, there is the question of the having a country as a country or a um, patria in a Spanish <coughs> word, homeland. Uh, that also is a as a figure of the centralization. Yeah? But when we come to the, and, uh, okay, so language, country, mother, you know, all are the figure of the centralization. So, but when we define poetry, as the figure, as a phenomenon of the decentralization, where we are going there? Nowhere but exile. Because we are decentralizing the figure of mother. She is not there with us anymore, as happened in my life. Decentralization in my own language. My language is not with me anymore. Decentralization of the country. I don't belong to that country anymore. So where they are? They are in a past living their own life. I don't have problem with that, you know. But in the same time, I myself have been decentralized and I still keep decentralizing myself from even my own self. Because having my own ego as a center is a problem. That, that turn to many, you know, world movements or things like that into problem because that a person who is not able to always decentralize himself mm -hmm. from his own ego, from his own self. We, we keep continuing that. Even our old, yeah, yeah, last night I read a poem of Cesar Vallejo. That poem of Cesar Vallejo uh, was speaking Spania, you know, to be taking care of himself from Spain itself. The, the fact that he was going from that conception was, was this, that uh, Cesar Bayejo was trying to speak of one thing important, that our own heroes in the left, our own uh, martyrs, we, if we were a hero in the past, if we don't centralize ourselves in that sense, we'll end up in a danger. Because what does it mean? that this person was a hero in the past? Or what does it mean that I have these heroes in the past? No? That means also a figure of centralization. No? But at the same time, yesterday I read a poem of the Antonio Gamoneda. He says, uh, speaking about the, the smell of suicide, that they will, uh, they will nourish your virtue and your uh, anger. That, that's a wonderful uh, statement of Antonio Moneda. He, we don't, we never are able to forget the smell of suicides. They live in us, but always we have this challenge with them, uh, with their smell bringing them close and bringing them far and talking to them. But being far or close, they will nourish two things. 
the anger and the virtue, virtue of us. The virtue is very important. There are many movements in the world called Gandhi, for example, you know, the so-called, uh, you know, what, what they say is that about them. Nine violent, non violent movement, okay. I don't know what does it mean, <laughs> but nonviolent movement try to uh, somehow propagate the virtue without looking at the anger side, which is also healthy. And the other side, there are movements who just propagate anger without seeing the virtue. And not having them together is the problem. The virtue and the anger. Who can forget Khomeini doing and killing those people? Who can forgive him? It's impossible. That's a part of anger. And I'm happy to have that anger. But at the same time, I'm happy to have a virtue of how I have to treat with that. And always it comes with the, with the decentralization of myself and my ego. If I let my ego to drive me, I, I let my virtue to go away. You know? And if I don't remember that, I will not have the anger of the centralization who I have to always criticize. To both of them are necessary. <laughs> okay, just a moment. <coughs> okay. Ali, you got your answer? Okay. <laughs> so I, I don't answer centralized way. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so Sarah? Well, but they are related. So yesterday you were talking about uh, Juan Germán and um, the way that he was living in Mexico, um, the way that he was, I don't know, trying to deal with or process, or I don't know what you can call it, the pain of his son being killed in Argentina and his... Uh, the daughter-in-law being killed and the son or the daughter, I don't know, the baby was given away to the dictator of the, of the, of the military. Um, and then uh, Helman never wanted to return to Argentina. For him there was no return. That was what he was saying. Um, and he directed also his funeral. So he said, no Argentinian politician allowed no Mexican state politician, just 35 people. So you were there. And now I'm going to Mahmoud Darvish and his letter of farewell to Edward Said. Oh. Now, you know, it is so beautiful and deep. And at the same time, I ask myself that this pain that we all share and melancholia that we all share can that be liberating? I believe that melancholia has a, has a liberating feeling when it comes to poetry. No. Not in politics, the normal politics sense. You know, I remember Juan uh, uh, in a period in Mexico. I was deadly in despair and I was I remember that I was very depressed at that time and Juan probably was the only person who actually helped me in that despair you know uh, the time that we was in his house he once he told me something very important that Mosen I guess that your body and your mind are living in a distance and they are separated violently you have to come back to your body you know? 
just just imagine this moment you know he told me that when he was in Italy he could not write poetry for four years and how he started to write poetry was for me was a, a miraculous moment you know that when he explained that he bought a series of the porn drawings and he started to write porn sonnets and he was telling that I was laughing a lot but laughter is very in important phenomenon of liberating there is no liberation possible without laughter we have to laugh no. we have to mock the power this where actually we put our feet on the position of the paradox of the power and we laugh at it so that's what Juan did to return back to writing and that's where actually the body and the mind come together you in the laughter the body laughs but on a conceptual phenomenon in the end you know so I came there and I started to think to Juan in this moment you know and I was thinking that what I have to do in the end I started to think to all my questions of the melancholy all the nostalgic things I had and how they actually co uh, could drive me to another so I started mocking myself no I do it constantly you know here I criticize myself I say about a lot of things you know probably most of the writer hates to say that I was doing this mistake and then I did this I enjoy doing it really I enjoy it no, not because that that okay honest uh, modesty or things like no I actually enjoy with the same laughter that Juan had to criticize myself to rebuild myself there, there is a there is a liberation point there and it's impossible poetry itself is liberating in itself you know because imagination is liberating there is who can write poetry without when we go to the first conception of creating other reality we are going to the liberation question no one had wonderful statement is that poetry just because of existence existing is a resistance just because this phenomenon exists a resistance happening but then he was telling that but if any poem written is a part of resistance I remember him saying that no you know in the Cuban revolution millions and millions poem were written in the whole Argentine and the whole uh, Latin America how much of them are good almost nothing almost not. no but that does me that does very important point there you know and I recorded this sort of the interview you know that I have them recorded when we were talking this sort of the things together so the fact is that in the end he was saying what is important in a poetry is a poem the poem itself is important okay but then remember another person in that discourse Ko On a Korean poet he says that I never wanted to be a poet I wanted to be a poem <coughs> and in that sense I see another point of the liberation there I hope that I could with this zigzag way respond to you so another question Spanish lo podemos hablar si queréis. Sí, no hay problema. <laughs> sí. Uh, no, yo no digo español, digo castellano. <laughs> sí, sí, es, es muy importante decir esto. Sí. 
I know there are lots of questions you have, so <laughs> come on. <laughs> Yeah, please. Um, well, because you were talking about decentralizing and recreating yourself and questioning what has, what seems to be fixed, questioning it and starting anew and like throwing away kind of what, what is fixed, that's what I understood. Um, I was thinking while well, I, 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 I can follow this thought and I agree with it very much. Um, but then I also think that I think it's also important also <coughs> yeah for for everything also to kind of know who you are. I mean there are many people who don't know who they are and they kind of are being thrown here and there and to crazy ideologies etc. They are they are open to be manipulated. It's, so that this is the other pole or also. A, a question for everybody to 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 kind of know who they are to kind of do have to, to kind of have a basis uh, I, I understand the the conception of having basis mm. the same way you're using the metaphor of the having a basis like mm. a like a uh, like a architecture mm. you know? but the problem is that when you are telling that these people are here and there are you speaking of their subjectivity being there or them as consumers being there or there you know not having con subjectivity mm -hmm. you know when i speak of the question of the mm -hmm. decentralization mm -hmm. i speak of the subjectivities mm -hmm. you know subjectivities decentralized person who actually thinks who he is and how the question is. So the problem is that in this, you know, horrible world that we are living now, most of the people are avoiding people having subjectivities. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the, you know, organizations or things like that, they are taking over people's subjectivities. So they actually don't think they are consumers. And they are living in a kind of the narrative history, which I myself also have to always question myself. If I myself, I'm really living in that narrative, you know, context or not, you know, to question that. Some people are able to question the box of their living. Some people, I, I'm not sure myself, I'm not sure that in which extent I am living with in the box of the my narrative story you know? so that that's the question that i always have to question myself you know but the same fact is that we have to see i cannot judge the mass we, we are unable to do that you know we have to just look that that the mass that we call them consumers this this or that we condemn them sometimes you know we we don't we we are not able to condemn individuals we can under condemn an attitude attitude of being just consumer without having subjectivity attitude of objectifying yourself in that sense you know not having subjectivity is condemned for me yes okay but looking at the people is another question Hmm. Yes. Uh, how is in, how is possible to make uh, poets as a collective action? Poetry as collective poetry. It's possible. It have done and have been done in several world, parts of the world. Okay, to write poetry as a collective. You know? uh, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult, but but the fact that it existed in the world just is is an answer that it existed, you know. But it, for example, in the Spanish language, Octavio Paz and the others did that, you know. So it existed in the world, and not bad poetry in the end, you know. Some very good poetry was written collectively, you know. But what you mean, 
I guess that's related to the social world and being poet there. No? To be poet in the society and collectively be poet in the society. Okay. That that is wonderful question and I'm I love it more than writing poetry in the <laughs> paper. You know. And I guess that that is also possible. But the question is that how and where we are going to touch each other rhythm. No? A body touching the rhythm of another person's rhythm. No? That is impossible without one concept, which I believe that is sacred. Even though I throw away many sacred concepts <laughs> from me, but there is one concept which for me is a still remains sacred. And that is brotherhood. Friendship. Friendship in the end. Friendship in the deepest aspect, not the way that we use in a Spanish <laughs> word, you know, or in Persian word, Tadash Refir Kamsalam. No. 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 Coming to the very aspect of uh, of the understanding another body and another person rhythmically with yourself. That's there the action come to turn to be poetry. The appearance of these two persons come to and it happened a lot in the history of the political activism. <coughs> you you probably can it's impossible to imagine many of the armed movement of the world without that brotherhood. It's impossible to imagine that. You know even not only in poetry, I go to the arm movement, you know. How can you imagine Che Guevara and Fidel separated? The bodies together. They were friends. All the critics we had is one side, but that moment that the Cuban Revolution comes to in the existence, which means that poetry was written, was impossible with these two bodies working to write or not all just these two body many other bodies there working together to write a poem which was the liberation of cuba that's all <laughs> still waiting So, uh, behalf of the catapult <coughs> and the local group of the catapult history truths, I'm gonna be like say thank you for all of you to coming today and being to, uh, with us in this like moment and yep, yeah, that's it. <laughs> thank you. And thanks, Mosa. Sobre su sombra, cada cual sobre su asombro alrededor.